Stars are gigantic chemistry labs. They're full of hydrogen gas, which they're constantly converting into all the other atomic elements. The most important of these, as far as life is concerned, is carbon. When a star dies, it explodes and it throws its ashes out into space. And in those ashes is carbon. After thousands of millions of years, the carbon created in those long dead stars eventually finds its way into every living thing. We are made of stardust. Stripped down to our raw ingredients, we consist of about 18% carbon. There's enough calcium in our bones for a two kilogram box of chalk. And enough iron in our blood for a small nail. But how did chemicals like these come together to make the first living things? Nobody had a clue until a young college student did a brilliant experiment which would transform our understanding of the origin of life. Stanley Miller and his teacher Harold Ure had the bright idea of recreating the chemical mix and environment of the infant Earth in miniature. Using apparatus like this, reconstructed here at Sussex University, Miller was about to try some chemistry that hadn't been seen on Earth for nearly four billion years. This is the equipment that Stanley Miller devised to recreate the early Earth's atmosphere. Miller surmised that the early Earth's atmosphere was an unbreathable mix of the gases hydrogen, methane and ammonia. This small flask of boiling water represents the sea. As the sea evaporates, a mixture of gases is introduced. The gases dissolve in the steam, and the whole lot enters this chamber here. And it's in here that the really interesting chemistry happens. These sparks recreate the electrical storms thought to have been ravaging the Earth all those years ago. And it's this bolt of energy that makes the steam and gases in here react together in unpredictable ways. After getting this big kick of energy, the gas and steam enters the condenser. And here the steam is turned back into water, falls as rain, and is carried back into the sea. This cycle of boiling, sparking, and condensing was repeated again and again, just as it would have on the ancient Earth. And then something strange started to appear in the bottom of the equipment. After a week of continual sparking, Miller found that he created an orangey red sludge. But this was no ordinary sludge. Under the chemical conditions he thought occurred on the Earth billions of years ago, Miller had created some of the stuff of life. Crucially, he had succeeded in creating amino acids. Amino acids are crucial chemicals because they are the building blocks of proteins. And proteins are what the bodies of living things are made of. Without amino acids, there could be no proteins. And without proteins, there could be no life. While Miller had succeeded in creating some of the stuff of life, science had no idea how such chemicals were assembled to make living things. This remained a tantalizing mystery. One which would be solved when two of the most famous names in the history of science made an astonishing announcement. Their discovery revolutionized biology and would, at long last, put science on the path to the origin of life. In 1953, one of science's greatest discoveries finally unlocked the secret of life. In January, Francis Crick and Jim Watson burst into that local pub to celebrate their success at working out the structure of a particular biological molecule, the now famous DNA. In cracking the structure of DNA, Crick and Watson had stumbled across the key to life itself. DNA looks like a spiral ladder. 
What Crick and Watson realized was that the rungs that hold the ladder together could carry the information needed to build the bodies of living things. The sequence of rungs along the DNA determines how amino acids are joined together to build bodies. This is the genetic code. The genetic code was the key to the secret of life. Its discovery explained how genetic information is stored and transferred. It's a system used by all living things, from amoebas to zebras. Crick and Watson's discovery solved the problem of how amino acids, like those created by Stanley Miller, were assembled into living things. But this knowledge also raised a new puzzle. DNA contains the blueprint of all living things. And so any theory of how life began has got to explain how DNA came into being. And somewhere between the origin of the Earth, where that flag is over there, and the first microorganisms over there, DNA first appeared. But how? Every DNA molecule that exists today is a copy of another. And that was a copy of a copy, and so on, and so on. If we go on like this, we eventually reach a point where we must ask ourselves, where did the original DNA molecule come from in the first place? This problem gave scientists a big headache. Solving the puzzle of the origin of DNA seemed totally impossible, but there was one small clue. And it lay at the heart of the process that turns DNA instructions into living things. In order for DNA's instructions to be converted into amino acid sequences, a chemical go-between is used. This chemical is related to DNA, but called RNA. RNA relays the message of how to build the bodies of living things. Now, it's RNA that could be the answer to the problem. RNA is the missing link between Crick and Watson's DNA instructions and the joining together of Stanley Miller's amino acids. Without RNA, life simply wouldn't exist. DNA is like a spiral ladder, with its two strands held together in a highly ordered, precise fashion. But RNA is only a single strand, shown here without its rungs. We can imagine it as a rope, and like a rope, some RNA molecules can be knotted into shapes like this. RNA's versatility was another clue that made scientists wonder whether it could be a relic from our pre-DNA past.